So believing is clearly something that human beings do and have always done. It's a characteristic of the way the human mind works from its very beginnings. It's clearly one strategy of the way we conceptualize and cope with the world around us, which at the best of times appears somewhat frightening. But where? in the geography of the human brain does belief originate? Where's its origin? Some of the leading research in this area of neuroscience is here at the Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, home of the world's largest nickel, where we asked neurologist Dr. Michael Persinger where in the brain belief resides. So start by just uh, orienting me and then show me where the right temporal lobe is where belief seems to come from. Well, this is the human brain, and if you remove it from the skull, this would be the front part of the brain, or the frontal lobes. And you can see there's two halves, left and right. And if we move it to the right side, the temporal lobes are here. The temporal lobe is here, the right one. And of course, this would be laying on the, on the skull itself. If you turn it upside down, you can see there's the continuation of the temporal lobe, often called the limbic lobe. I think it's now well established from lots of studies of what happens when people have strokes or head wounds that affect one side of the brain or the other, particularly the temporal lobes, that there's a mechanism in there that in normal times produces feelings of awe and wonderment when we see something beautiful, we see the solution to a problem when something good happens to us. I mean, it's part of an area, a large interconnected group of nuclei in the brain called the limbic system. If you stimulate the human brain of the normal person appropriately, you can generate a sensed presence that's very mystical and has all the characteristics of a god or religious experience. So when we believe, are we making contact with the mind of God? Or is it God in the mind? Dr. Persinger began his research where most neurologists have left off, searching for that part of our brains where our belief systems reside. How's that feel? Okay. Is the, is the banana flying? With technology described more as basement workshops than NASA, Dr. Persinger has fashioned a helmet through which he can induce magnetic fields in the brain which simulate a small, complex epileptic seizure. Move your left hand, just your right one. And I need you to place this on so that's... How does that feel? Good. Are your ears okay? Yep. Very important. Yeah, they are. Okay. Fine. The results are opening up the possibility that what we think of as external forces acting on us are actually being created in the mind. Liz is in there through the solenoids in the helmet. She's getting this pattern. This is very much like a seizure light pattern. We're applying it primarily over the right temporal lobe, the right hemisphere. Each line has a value between 0 and 255 as translated into voltage. You could generate any complex pattern you want and apply it to the brain. So the person's brain is being bathed right now in this particular pattern. In the last 1,000 people have gone through the chamber in the last 15, 20 years, they're in a context that's experimental, so they know that it, it's experimental. But even then, many people report a religious feature to it, a mystical component. So at this instant, the right temporal lobe of Liz's brain doesn't know whether it's having, as it were, its own creative, deep spiritual experience whether it's getting one from outside, it can't tell the difference. The, the, the temporal lobe can't tell the difference for sure, but since she's in a chamber and she knows she's safe and she's signed a consent form, she, she effectively knows that nothing adverse will happen. But technically speaking, this is going to be a subjective experience that's going to be as real as any other subjective experience. So you stay here, I'll have a okay. All right, now, uh, Liz, uh, you were exposed to a complex magnetic field over your right temporal region. And it says, I felt as if I were somewhere else. Yeah, not in this room at all. Well, where were you? I don't know. I, 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 can't, I, I don't know. I was sort of, I think I was, I don't know, I think I was, maybe, I thought maybe I was falling asleep a little bit, but I don't know. But it wasn't relaxing. Like, the time passed very slowly, and uh, I don't know. 
All right. It also says that uh, the same idea kept occurring again and again. What idea was it? Um, that that there was something in here with me. Okay. Now, Ian, you've been doing this for many years now. What are the sort of typical things that people report when their right temporal lobe is bathed in this electromagnetic imitation of a seizure? Usually when you stimulate the right temporal lobe, you get the sensed presence. And we begin, we now realize that the sense of self, who you are, is a left hemispheric process tied to language. But the right hemispheric equivalent is this feeling of a sensed presence, of an entity that's slightly different from you, with which you are somewhat familiar, and it has all the characteristics of the right hemisphere. It's forever, it's spatial, it's highly meaningful, and it's somehow very personal. And you felt the presence was where? On my head, okay. or behind me. Okay. Perhaps, I don't know, one of these. Just for curiosity, did it feel like a male or a female? Um, probably a male. There was a sense of presence, um, more or less, on my um, left side, whereas I can only describe it as um, my grandfather, um, more or less, touching um, my side. And he's the only one that, I've, that has ever passed away that I've ever been emotionally close to. I don't know if you want to say, like, guardian angel or any of those other labels, but it was very, very safe. Um, and I've only ever experienced that within his presence. Individuals who feel a, a member of their family who has been dead visit them in the chamber. They want to come back to feel them again. How can we use the information that you've accumulated and you've just been talking about to help us in the future? Well, the more we understand about the human brain, the more we can predict and control it. And I think if there is the alternative hypothesis that maybe God really doesn't exist, that maybe beliefs are simply peculiarities or maybe normal adaptive features of the brain. Assuming we have these alternative ideas, then we don't have to go, God doesn't exist, he does exist. We can eliminate that dichotomous argument and say there are third explanations, there are third order explanations, that maybe the experience that God exists may have a different explanation. It may not be what everybody thinks it is. It may be a feature of the brain itself, in which case we better understand it very well because it doesn't really prove one way or the other if God exists or not. It just simply proves that human beings have a brain that will allow them to believe in God.